I'm Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of the Business of Fashion, and welcome to Drive, BOF's new podcast series delivered by DHL, where we hear the stories of fashion's most dynamic entrepreneurs in their own words. Today, I sit down with Bobby Kim, founder of the Los Angeles-based streetwear label, The Hundreds. There's this thing in Korean culture called Han. I've always capitalized on that Han, on that energy and that, that frustration and try to convert it into ways where I can not only better the world for myself, but better the world for everyone else. You know, I think that is the job of an artist, is to not make yourself look better, but to make the world look better. It was never a business play for us, and I think the way that we structured this company is kind of unorthodox, especially in light of how modern entrepreneurship goes. So here's my conversation with Bobby Kim to learn what it really takes to build a global fashion business from scratch. Good morning, Bobby. Good nice, morning. nice to be here with you. We're here in Los Angeles, your home base. Yeah. And I'm really pleased uh, to have the opportunity to talk you talk to you about the hundreds and the the empire you've built from. Um, how many years has it been now? It's been 15 as of July, so we're 15 years in. Right. So, but where where I'd like to start really is um, actually what you were like growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, our, our, the series is called Drive, and yep. I'm really trying to understand what drives people. So maybe maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you were like. Uh, growing up, I think you were born in Baltimore, right? And then yeah. you, you moved here to LA. Yeah, I was uh, exactly. I was born in Baltimore, and I don't remember much of it. I probably spent a few years there, and then my parents moved to Southern California. You know, they were part of that first wave of Asian immigrants that came after the Immigration Act of '65, and so they bounced they immigrated around. Immigrated from they, where? They immigrated from South Korea. So uh, when they first entered the States, as a lot of Asian communities did, they kind of got displaced a little bit. They started off in Sulphur, Oklahoma. I think that's uh, where they try to lay their roots, which is strange to think that I could have grown up there. And then Baltimore, and then eventually they found their way to Southern California. How is that shaped yeah. Bobby today. So I didn't grow up in LA proper. I grew up an hour inland in Riverside, which is a completely different universe if you're from Southern California. It's smog and rocks and really hot temperatures in the summer. And we really didn't have much to, to we, we weren't offered much. We kind of had to make do with what we had. We turned uh, drainage ditches into skate parks or uh, the few artist friends that we had, we didn't have access to the best art schools, so we resorted to something like graffiti, and we didn't have baseball fields, let's say, so we had uh, to skate and go to punk shows and stuff like that. So I grew up, I think, looking back on it now, I mean, I knew at the time I was really angry, but now I think I have a better understanding and context of why I I felt so angry. I was a middle child, so we can begin there. Uh, I was an immigrant, uh, coming from an immigrant family, so um, a middle child of a brown and Asian family in a community that was largely white at the time and became more and more Latino over over the years. And um, I also just never really quite felt heard being in that environment, in that context. So I gravitated towards punk rock, right? So that's like a music genre for people who aren't feeling heard and, and they want to express themselves. They want to sing along with the bands and then um, as far as skateboarding goes too, like I didn't fit neatly into an, a sport. I'm not the most athletic guy, but I was really drawn to the culture and the art. And it was it was a world of iconoclasts and uh, skateboarding kind of lets you create your own rules. So I think it was very autonomous. I was very independent, contrarian, you know, just a defiant person. And, and my parents could probably attest to that. Pretty difficult guy. How did you channel that? anger emotion into something creative there's this thing in korean culture called han and it's something that you can actually wikipedia h-a-n and uh who knows if it's like a real thing like based in science but it's this feeling of a, a repressed emotion and koreans have it you know we do not know how to communicate properly or the way that we should so our frustrations and our anger and resentment it always 
comes out in many passionate ways. You know, it can be all from love. It can, and, and it can also come out in anger and violence. It can also come out in a sense of art. And so you um, are seeing the fruits of that. There are so many brilliant young Korean artists and illustrators and um, performers and K-pop, Korean uh, film, cinema. Uh, the reason why these media are driving a lot of the global pop culture is be- it's stemming from Han. I've always capitalized on that Han on that energy and that that frustration and try to convert it into ways where I can not only better the world for myself but better the world for everyone else you know I think that is the job of an artist is to not make yourself look better but to make the world look better how did your immigrant Korean parents react to the idea of their middle child pursuing art uh, not well not well. And, and, and it's funny because both my parents are naturally inclined to artists. Um, but, you know, they grew up in the Korean War and, and they were never told that that was um, a potential uh, career choice for them. You know, that, that there was, there was, it was not, um, it, it didn't seem like there was any opportunity there. And so for them to go through all they did in immigrating and providing so much for us and uh, jumping through all these barriers and then their middle son is saying, I want to be an artist, you know, that was, I always say that's like the equivalent of like in a white family, if you tell your parents you want to be a race car driver, you know, it's just like, oh my God, you're going to die. Like right. you, there's no hope for you. It's a hopeless future. And um, so they didn't, they didn't take to it well. And in, in fact, it took, you know, I went to law school and I graduated and it took me maybe three or four years after we'd started our brand to where my family finally started to understand what was going on. I think they had you know, I was on the cover of some Korean American magazine, and and that's always what it takes in immigrant is cultures is like if you're on that that um, ethnicity's like media, you're good. It's just like, oh, okay, the you're, Koreans are saying you're, you're literally the poster child. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's they just need. It's funny. It's like they don't need to prove it to themselves or to a greater world. They just need to prove it to this subsect of friends their their in their immediate community of like five friends or their their sister or brother and they just need to prove it to them and then they're good and so those media forms are always like a validation that you know you've made it and and, it, and that's it so do you think one of the things that drives you is to make your parents proud yeah i think that's um not in all of us but that's always buried deep down is that I'm looking for validation from my parents, validation from my dad, especially still searching for it, you know, and in many ways, not just in terms of career, but that I'm, um, that I'm making him proud in terms of just like who I've become as a man. And, and, um, I I think I have, you know, I don't, again, we're really poor at communicating, especially in our family. So I don't really know like how he feels about everything that I've done, you know, (laughs) But I want to believe that I've made him proud and like I'll probably feel like that the rest of my life. Okay, so you mentioned law school, which um, strikes me as quite an odd choice for someone who already knew at a very young age that he was very creative. You loved sketching and drawing and all that stuff. So why go to law school? The arts were not a viable career choice for me, or that's what I've always been told. No one had ever given me permission to even think like that. And so I had two career paths in front of me. I could go into medicine or I can go into law. Okay, it's very, again, very much an Asian upbringing in the States. I was freelancing a ton after college, after undergrad. I was uh, freelance writing, freelance photo, freelance art and design. What did you study in undergrad again? I studied everything. I'm just one of these people. If I take it, when I take a personality test, I'm right down the line. I'm everything. I'm every zodiac sign. I'm every like I'm every behavior. I'm right down the middle. I'm not an extreme one way or the other. And so when I went to college, I started off with a triple major. So that was in media, graphic design and theater. And then I added psychology in there because I got really interested in like sociology and psychology and then like political science. So everything just kind of merged into I ended up with like triple minor, a major it was yeah so I don't know I studied everything in our school I went to UC San Diego and there's five colleges I was actually a part of all five colleges at once as well and um, I graduated from school still didn't know what I want to do because this was pre-internet and so the world was actually a lot tighter 
a lot more limited in terms of the opportunities you had as far as like your capabilities and skill sets. And so I knew I would like to do art. I like I like to freelance. And magazines kind of gave me that chance to do it from a freelance perspective. The problem is 9/11 happened. And right in, as I was starting this all up, and all the magazines and media dried up. The publishing houses kind of closed their doors and advertisers pulled out, not unlike what's happened over the last you know five years again. Um, and I couldn't find work. And so I moved to Japan and I got really involved in street culture. And I started writing for a lot of like street magazines out there and just really delving into Bathing Ape and all these Japanese fashion brands. I just loved it because for the first time I felt like there was a genre of clothing that really included me because there was so much Asian representation. There was people of color that were actually running the brands. They weren't just uh, faces of the brands. You know, they weren't just the customers of the brands. Um, I loved the exclusive, the limited, the nature of the brands. And so after having gone out there and, and learning about all that stuff, I realized that I still couldn't do that as, again, a potential career choice, and I needed a real job. And so I looked at law because everyone's like, you're a good writer, you're argumentative, and you're very politically active, right? So I'd been an activist since I was a, a young teen, and so I felt like I could kind of break shit up from the inside. That was kind of my philosophy was look, like there's only so much I can do as an outside person just like screaming. And maybe if I can get in, I can actually make some real change in the world. And so much of it was from a career standpoint. And it was also to um, it was also politically act, m politically motivated as well. So you finish law school. Mm -hmm. What happens next? I finish law school and then uh, actually in the midst of law school, I felt like it just it wasn't what I wanted to do. And so a couple things happened in law school. The first one was I started this creative project, which eventually became The Hundreds. And I did it as an outlet because I had, again, all this repressed creativity. And I was just like, I need to put it all into one project. Blogs had just started. So this was like around 2000. Blogger had launched in 99. I had been running my own personal blog. And I was like, if I can put everything into a blog. And so the idea of it was media first. It was editorial, copy, storytelling, whatever you want to call it today. It was that first. So it was a place where I could write, I could share stories, I could take photographs, and then I could apply it to t-shirts and tell these like, basically it was like an all encompassing, like a, what you'd say like today's like media plus e -com plus experiential or whatever it is. like. That was just the idea back then was just how can I connect to as many people as possible? I want to connect to them through my writing. I want them to wear my clothes. I want those clothes to refer back to my writing. And everything was constantly pointing back in so, the direction. So clothes were part of that idea even then? Yes. T it was, and it wasn't clothes. It was just T-shirts. And it was T-shirts based off of what I'd been really admiring from Supreme and A Bathing Ape and Stussy and Jive and Extra Large and all the 90 streetwear brands. But it wasn't intended to just be a streetwear brand. I remember our first few stores that we walked into and I would tell them, what we were doing and they were just like well, we'll make what makes you different from any other t-shirt company and i was like we're not a t-shirt company and i'm like i know it looks like that now but i knew you know 15 years back when you talk about the hundreds it's not just a t-shirt company i knew it was going to be this greater thing it was a lifestyle brand which at the time no one was referring to their brands as lifestyle brands but it was a true lifestyle brand and it was all pointing back to this ongoing narrative of my life I was just like, when I design something, I'm going to talk about it on my blog. So I'll say, like, this is how I felt today. I designed a T-shirt about it. You can go and buy it now. This was in 2003. And that type of interaction and engagement with our customer base was kind of revolutionary, not just in streetwear, but in greater fashion. At that time, my website had more views than Gucci, than any other fashion company in the world. We were the biggest fashion website and it was an unknown t-shirt brand started by two kids in LA. So you're doing this, you started this while you're at law school. Yeah. And eventually, um, I think, you know, you must have been, had to still make a decision because it sounds like in the early days it was a, a project. Like how did you? Right, okay, so <laughs> I know, I'm sorry, I'm super long-winded with this stuff. I've been writing a, a memoir for the last year and so 
I've actually had time to let these stories breathe and to really delve into them. And then it's brought up all these memories that I haven't thought about in like 15 years. But um, in the middle of school, so uh, I start this project and I kind of see it as like a side project. And I met my partner, Ben, um, who was in my class. And we had bonded over sneakers, of course, a very streetwear story. He, you know, I was wearing some Nikes and he's wearing some, uh, he's wearing Jordans, I was wearing Air Force Ones. We were talking about our shoes and he was wearing a Supreme shirt and I was wearing like an A-Life shirt or something. And we were like, oh, that's cool. You found a kindred spirit in law school. Yeah. Because, at, again, in context, 2003, there were maybe 100 people in all of L.A. wearing Supreme. If you saw somebody wearing Supreme, you knew that they were either cool or doing something really cool. It was like guaranteed. You could go up to them and be like, what do you do? Uh, I'm a I'm an independent filmmaker. Um, I'm an artist or something cool. I'm an actor. Like I, I know, you're like okay. Like how did you get that? Because you had to first of all you had to know what it was. Then you had to fly to New York to get it. You know you had to like find the stores. And so that was a cool appeal of streetwear at the time was that if someone was wearing like real streetwear or we didn't call it streetwear back then, but like whatever those brands were, you are automatically felt a kindred spirit. And so we spotted each other from a mile away. You know we were like in a in a law school, there was maybe like 100 people in our class. And, and I remember the first day on campus, I was just like, cool, there's someone who gets it here. You know, and everyone else is wearing normal clothes and, you know, they're going to law school and whatnot. But we become friends. I tell him about this project and he wants to help me on it because he's like, look, like, I know how to make this a viable business. I never thought that I could actually make money off of doing it again, right? Like, i never given myself that permission. And so he's just like, I can run this, you know, like, He's like, I'm a Persian Jew. I can make money. And I'm like, all right, fine. Like, even better. Icing on the cake. And so he started running with it. He was kind of doing the sales and providing the infrastructure and the operations behind it. And uh, I was just running the creative. And we started it that summer. It was the first summer after our first year of law school. Now, simultaneously, I was working at the Superior Court downtown in L.A. And I was working for a research attorney. And, um, you know, I had he was my mentor. And this man was 40 years old and he was dying of cancer and his name was Abe. And um, I worked for him the entire summer and by the end of the summer he was doing really poorly and he told me, look, like, you're one of the best I've had. You have a bright career. I remember he said, you are going to have all the cars in the world. He's like, you're going to have all the women. And I was like, cool, I'm good. Like, sign me up. And he's just like, but don't do it. And I was just like, why? And he's like, because every day for lunch in the summer, he and I would leave the courthouse and when we would break away from work, I would sit down and I would talk to him about the hundreds and I would say, hey, look at this T-shirt I designed and look at this piece I wrote. And he just never said anything. He just kind of like silently looked on. And he was like, all that time, what you were doing was you're really chasing your passion, like you were really living this dream. And he's like, look, do you want to be like me, 40 years old one day and dying of cancer? And for him, it wasn't a mistake. He's like, it was my dream to be an attorney. I was one of the best in the city to do it. I have no regrets. It's what I was called to do. He's like, you're going to be great at being an attorney. He's like, you're probably going to be one of the best. But you're going to be 40 years old one day. You might be dying. And do you want to say that you committed your life to doing something that you didn't really love? And um, it was the first time that anyone in my life had given me permission to do what I wanted to do. You know, like no one had actually shown me that door and been like, dude, go and do that thing. Like, you can do it, you know? Like, you don't have to listen to anybody else. When you're 40 years old, like, no one matters. Your parents don't matter. Society doesn't matter. Your friends, like, it doesn't matter, especially if you're on your deathbed. So, like, what matters is what you want to do. And as soon as he kind of opened that door for me, I seized it, and we just never looked back. Like, with the hundreds, it, it all came from that one conversation with Abe. And he actually ended up passing away a few months later, but um, it really... If it weren't for him, I don't think we would have ever been here today. Wow, that's a, that's it's incredible that you can point to that one moment as kind of the inflection point in your head to like, in a way, lift the burden of expectation from the way you grew up and the expectations from your parents, but also find a way to to express that Han. Yeah, you know, in a way that you know was allowing you to express yourself but also with your partner like turn it into a business yeah it is it, it's really funny i didn't realize like what he was doing for me at the time and it's really easy and, and it's very sharp and clear for me to look back on it now 15 years later and see like what he had done but yeah again like he had opened that 
that door for me that I never even knew existed, and, and um, it was transformative. This podcast is delivered by DHL. As the logistics partner of many of fashion's biggest and most prestigious businesses, DHL is stitched into the fabric of the $2.4 trillion industry. Now present in more than 220 countries and territories, DHL has decades of expertise in logistics and is the world's leading partner for the fashion, jewelry, and lifestyle industries, delivering over 1 billion parcels each year. Drawing on its entrepreneurial expertise, DHL offers tailored logistic solutions suitable for any fashion business, from emerging designers to established global mega brands to independent stores, e-commerce giants, and direct-to-consumer startups. For more information about DHL, visit DHL.com. Once, once you kind of go decide to go, you know, all in, yeah, full, you know, head first into this business. Like, tell me about the journey of actually, you know, once you, I, I can relate to to this a little bit myself because when I started BOF, like it was just a a passion project, right? And there came a point where I was like, okay, I'm either gonna like make this my full time thing and really try to build a company, or I have to stop because it's just like, taking too much time, like. And it's just that that switching point where you're like, okay, the reason you do it now is not just for love and passion. You have to do it because, you know, there's something you can build and there's a there's a real business opportunity. So how did you see the business opportunity back then? <laughs> I still don't really quite see the business opportunity. It was never a business play for us. And I think the way that we structured this company is kind of unorthodox, especially in light of how modern entrepreneurship goes. You know, even yesterday at your summit and I was watching, you know, I, I love Moj and Michael and, and w even when they're talking about like funding and VCs and mission statements and business plans and all that stuff, like we didn't do that. And that's kind of the charming appeal of, of streetwear or real true independent streetwear started by kids in their garages is that it's everyone's first business. It's everyone's first foray into can I make a profit and margins and like, you know, staying organized and production and all these things. And hopefully it elevates, you know, I meet people today that are famous chefs and and they own hotels and they're like, hey, I started off by reading your blog and learning how to build a streetwear brand. So for us, we just never stopped. Like our streetwear brand just kept growing even though we had no infrastructure. And so we didn't think that it could have been a very successful business back then. And to this day, we still don't really get it. Like I don't quite understand all the mechanics of what I'm doing, but it's keeping me afloat. And I figured out a way to where I can survive and, and thrive in this environment. But I mean, look, to be honest, like I still, I don't remember ever a point of us like figuring it out, making it, Oh my God, the, I, I, maybe the closest that can come to is near the end of law school is when we were getting, we were preparing for the bar, you know, cause Ben and I promised ourselves like, we have to take the bar exam, you know, like we're, we're, we've invested three years into the school, even though we'd been running the brand for two years at the point where we, we should take the bar exam. But right before we took the bar, Ben said, hey, look, I just ran over some of the numbers and we may not have to be lawyers. And I was just like, oh my God. And it wasn't like, oh, we're gonna make $150,000 a year. He was saying, hey, we're gonna be able to pay rent, right. you know, which on my studio apartment in Venice, it was at the time like 600 bucks a month. And I was just like, oh my God, we're making $600 a month? Like, we're so rich. And I've never really lost that perspective on my entire career, the way I live, it's just like, I can have enough just to keep me keep the dream going, then I'm happy. Everything else on top of that has always been ancillary, right? I tell people this all the time. I'm like, if if I get valued at a billion dollars, it'll probably never happen, you know? But like just because James and uh, with Supreme they got valued at a billion dollars. You're like, oh my God, what happens if you get valued at a billion dollars? I'm like, nothing changes in my life. I'll probably buy a yacht or a house in the colony in Malibu, but I'll still be at work every day in Vernon. I'll still be with the same team. I'll still be making all the same shit. Like nothing changes. So it didn't matter. All I needed was a $600 to pay rent. I needed to be able to eat at least twice a day, sometimes three if I'm like really pushing it. Everything on top of that is just like, cool. You know, it's just, it's as long as I can just keep this going, I'm so happy. That's a billion, a billion dollars to me, really. The hundreds as a streetwear business back in the early 2000s, like what, what made it different to both 
other streetwear brands and fashion in general. Like for the person that doesn't really understand the streetwear phenomenon, that is obviously now at a, a state, and we'll get to that a bit later. But you know, what was that that made hun- the hundreds unique? I think this idea of authenticity and branding is what everyone's latching onto today. Like, how do we be authentic? How do we be? How do we be human and personable? And Early streetwear already captured that es- essence, and that's why it was successful. You know, young teenage kids, young men and women that are that are f- finding their way in the world and learning about brands, they're the fastest ones to pick up on the bullshit. They sniff it out right away. And so if you can survive and, and again, thrive in that customer base and in that marketplace, you win. The reason why streetwear has been able to win and has been able to maintain and you know, even in the early 2000s, they're like, oh, this is a fad. And, you know, there's so many people saying like, oh, you guys are having a moment. It's going to die. It's still crushing it. Like, it blows me away that it still has some kind of a stranglehold on high fashion. Like, we're still talking about the same brands and designers. Like, this does not typically happen in fashion. Like, fashion is, it, by its nature, supposed to overturn. And we're supposed to get some new stuff. And what was in your closet? Like, you can't have that same thing in your closet. Like, but we've been kind of sticking to, to streetwear, just like music has kind of been sticking onto rap. And you're like, wait, rap was like an underground niche phenomenon. Like, why is it like only getting bigger, more pervasive, dominating all pop music? It's the same thing is that it came from such an authentic, honest place. Streetwear was very un- unapologetic from its inception. It was about, I don't care about being a big, big brand. It's not just about all the money. It's just about expression. It's about being true, staying true, saying no, right? Like, to me, the essence of of the best branding is um, you look at a brand like, I'm just since we're on the topic of Supreme, look at what James has done. To, to me, the essence of best branding is saying no. Like, how many times can you say no over and over and over again? Streetwear kids, streetwear designers, streetwear brands have no problem saying no. Especially when you wave money in front of their face, they're like, fuck off. Like, I don't need it. Stay core, stay poor, stay pure, stay poor. It's like the same idea of we don't need you. We never needed you. You need us. If anyone ever comes to us to collaborate, I'm like, I don't need you. I'm doing perfectly fine. So when you come off of a baseline of we are fine on our own. We never needed anybody else. We don't need to be in your store. We don't need to sit next to you on the rack. Like that attitude, which just comes from being like a complete teenage asshole. But that attitude, if you never lose it, it just makes for the best brands and everyone wants to be your friend, you know? And it's just because you're being honest and pure and you're being so true to yourself. People love that. The other big part of streetwear brands for me that make them really different and distinguished from kind of mainstream fashion is this idea of community. So when I see all these kids outside the Supreme store in London, like you you get a real sense that they're part of a tribe, you know, and it's, you know, there's obviously an element of aspiration in there, like all fashion brands or high fashion brands have aspiration in them, but you don't get the sense that that real, um, that notion of community is part of other fashion. Yeah, yeah that's what I always say that, uh, you know, streetwear without culture is just fashion, right? Like, th- again, that word culture and, and the, the word of community has been thrown around so much. But the reason being that it's true. <laughs> like, we are not about clothes. Like, we at the end of the day, what is streetwear? Like, I can't even define what it is. It's t-shirts, graphic t-shirts. Okay, every genre of clothing makes graphic t-shirts. Um, now it's just like, oh, if you have a hoodie in your line, you're streetwear. You know, oh, you have sneakers, you're streetwear. Streetwear doesn't really exist outside of what the community represents, the the history, the culture, the people coming together. And so it took me many, many years to realize, wait, what I'm really doing here is I'm just bringing people together. I wanted to touch a bit on how you actually kind of launched the brand because we, we missed that bit. And I think it's a really important part of, you know, actually when you started selling product, when when you and your partner, you know, decided that you were going to try to sell stuff. Like, how did you go from like kind of doing art for yourself as a project to selling stuff? Yeah, um, the first part of selling anyone is selling yourself on it, right? Like just convincing myself that we could do that. Like, does anyone actually want to buy? Like my t-shirts are so bad. And uh, again, to to this point that streetwear is really just about t-shirts. It, it, fashion to me is an, a higher art form. 
You know, there really is an expertise in design involved. You know, people get, have go through schooling. Um, they get mentored. Streetwear, if you look at the basis of a lot of these brands and upstarts, the design is very poor. And so there's also a beauty in that design in that it's referencing that it's coming from like a very raw, emotive place for people. And so when I look back on our early stuff, it was really poorly designed. The kerning in the letters and the graphics was off, or the t-shirts that we chose to print on were like really bad t-shirts. But we didn't see any of that. All we saw was, we have a story to tell. We believe that we're important. Again, I want to be heard because I hadn't felt like I'd been heard for 20 years. And so what is... Uh, I want to engage, I want to connect with a person. Can a store help facilitate that through my clothing? And so the clothing was almost like an afterthought. Of course, at the time, I thought the clothing was everything. But now when I look back and I'm like, I really wasn't trying to sell clothing. I was just trying to get onto a platform so that more and more people could see me, so more and more people could hear our voice. I just needed visibility. And over time, I learned that progression in design, and I taught myself, and I learned, and I would like to think our designs have gotten better since then, but it's interesting to me to think on all those store buyers and what they were seeing when they saw our product. And the first person who gave us a shot was Tony at Fred Siegel Street in Santa Monica. That store does not exist anymore, but he really believed in us. He invested in us. And so it's something, it's a philosophy that my partner Ben and I have carried on when we invest in other companies and we invest in brands, we invest in people. Like we do not look at what the product is in front of us. I'd like to look beyond it and see the human be like, oh my God, there's so much potential in here. And he saw that. So what what did he see in you specifically? Like how did you sell him on the hundreds? The fir- again, uh, the first thing we told him was this is not, he's just like, what makes you different from every other t-shirt brand? And I said, we're not a t-shirt brand. He's just like, all you're showing me are like five t-shirts on a printed Xerox line sheet. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's not about that. It's about the stories. Now, when you go, when you buy the T-shirt, there's a website address attached to the bag. People will go to the website, and he's like, "A, a website? Like, what, what is was this? This was, this was 2003, and he's just like, what does a website have to do with clothing? You know, like this it, again. It was almost nerdy to be involved in anything internet related, especially from a street culture standpoint. You know, like we were the complete dorks for the first two to three years. I mean, we're probably, we're still the dorks of of streetwear. But at the time, everyone was just like, this is inauthentic because it's online. This is inauthentic because they're exploiting the community and the culture and putting it on the internet. It should stay off the internet. It should stay off the screens. You know, at the point it was just like screenware. Like I'd written this essay about screenware and what it means for the internet streetwear to finally collide. And now it's just, you know, obviously nobody thinks about it. Every brand starts off with not only doing e-com, but only doing e-com. You know, uh, back then it was just like, you should only sell through stores and not do direct. And now it's like, only do direct, don't sell through stores. And so it just flip flopped in a decade. Um, but he really believed in us, like in this story of like, it's not just the t shirts. Cause I was just like, look, like maybe it's not the best t shirts, but we're the best, we're the coolest. And we had to convince him of that. You know, I remember when we walked into that meeting and we showed him our stuff and he was just like, what is this? And we're like, we're the hundreds. Like, you've never heard of us? And he was just like, I, I, I don't know. And I'm like, I thought this was the coolest store in LA. And he was just like, it is. And I'm like, how have you not heard of the hundreds? <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, yeah. Or he was just like, okay, well, I'll, I'll take an order. And we're like, all right, just put it on consignment. You'll see. And we just kind of like left him the product and, and walked out. And as soon as we walked out those doors, I called up my girlfriend, Ben called up his brother and said, hey, start calling Fred Siegel start showing to Fred Siegel. And we just camped out in the parking lot for the first two weeks. We sat in, there's a corner space in the parking lot under these trees. And we just sat there, we'd eat lunch in the car. Our, we'd call our friends, they'd come down, we'd hand them 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 40 bucks, whatever. They'd go and buy a shirt, give it back to us. And we just would collect all this inventory back in our trunk. And so after two weeks, we are like, all right, now it's time. And we literally just kind of, we just kind of strolled through the front doors and walked by Tony's desk and he was like, hey, He's like, hey, guys, guys, what's going on? And we're like, hey. He's just like, dude, your shit is hot. I can't keep it on the shelves. And we're like, yeah, we told you that was going to happen. And he's just like, okay, let's put in a deeper order. And so he actually put in a, a substantive order. And then as soon as that happened, we drove across town to Brooklyn Projects, our friend Dom's skate shop on Melrose. It's a cool skate shop in L.A. And he was just like, what's your brand? And we're like, the hundreds. 
never heard of it. I'm like, really? Because Fred Siegel's killing it. He's like, really? He's like, that's my boy Tony over there. Go ask Tony. So he calls up Tony. Tony's just like, I can't keep, keep the shit on the shelves. He's just like, all right, I'll put in an order. As soon as that happened, we drove to Pasadena. There's a store called Gray One. Is the other cool street where store. We're like, he's just like, never heard of you. Really? Call up Dom. Call up Fred Siegel. And it just went like that. Within two weeks, we were in five of the best stores in L.A. And we just put those front and center on a website. When you open up the website, here are the five stores we're in. Just looks like cosigns when you get into cool stores. And so all of a sudden, people felt more comfortable buying from us. So but how did you turn the kind of hype of like false false demand from your friends and your girlfriend to like real customers? So it just, I never looked at it from a macro level. I just, uh, I've, and to this day, you know, we sell around the world, but I'm always just about convincing one person at a time. I don't know how it, it blew up, but it, I want to believe it just took that me selling to one person and that one person told three of his friends and his three friends just latched on and... Um, our, one of our logos is called the wildfire flag and it, it's indicative of that in that it just takes like one person and it can catch on very fast and you cannot underestimate the passion and the zeal that people can hold towards a brand in someone else's dream like it can catch so fast and there is no explaining it yeah so how did you take the business beyond LA mm-hmm. uh, and take it kind of you know elsewhere in the US and then take it global at that time, I mean, there was a few things. The internet helped, right? So because we were so pervasive on the internet and because these street culture kids were on the front lines of blogs, the word spread pretty fast within our communities. Although streetwear wasn't like a global phenomenon, there were streetwear kids and people everywhere that were reading my blog. Like I would fly to Paris and people, I would walk into stores and they would literally be on my blog as I'd walk in, hey, you're the guy, I'm reading your blog right now. You know, we go to Tokyo, same thing. And so the internet just helped so much about circulating the name of our brand. Also, just because of the names that we were associated with in LA, as far as people we were collaborating with, but also the stores that we were in, that opened up a dialogue with New York. And so we got into Union New York, and once you're in a store like Union New York, which is one of the pioneers of streetwear, streetwear boutiques, um, you know, we're in Union LA, and then all of a sudden we started getting into cooler stores in America, and we would, again, put those front and center on a website. We are co-signed by these stores, we are selling, we're in Colette, like, I remember the day we got into Colette, and Sarah emailed us, was like, hey, I want to carry you guys, we just thought it was the coolest thing in the world, you know, like, there's a few milestones, that was one of them, because we were recognized, not just internationally, but by the coolest store, and so we're like, we're in Colette, you know, and uh, still, you know, it's, it's, it was just such a big deal. So I, th- I think the internet helped a lot. And we also just started doing trade shows, which trade shows are in a weird state right now, you know, maybe dead, uh, maybe in flux. But at the time, it, it brought a community of people together. And that's why I always say about tre- trade shows, it's it's not really about selling. It's not really about like entering new doors. It's about meeting people. And we got to meet so many people and build our community through those trade shows. When the business went global and you, you kind of started popping up in places like Colette. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ha- struggle with like logistics and like shipping and all the kind of like, tell me about that. Since we didn't go to school for this and since no one really showed us the ropes, we kind of had to teach ourselves along the way. And um, my partner, Ben, has pretty much mastered all of that and, and, and figured out how to run that machine over time. But yeah, we went through a lot of, lot of growing pains, still make colossal errors that cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars you know they they started off really small and then they just get bigger as you get bigger let's let's shift now to streetwear the phenomenon that it is today i read this some of your essays and things that you've been putting up you're still you're still quite prolific with your words and you've been kind of calling bullshit on some of the the kind of hype around the streetwear market, its intersection with luxury. Talk to me a bit about your thoughts on that because they're quite provocative. I don't even know where to begin, but um, you know, I, I, I actually don't really have a problem with streetwear in high fashion. I think streetwear in high fashion have always had a dialogue and this symbiosis. You know, um, For the most part, I point back to what Sean Stussy was doing in the early 80s as the inception of streetwear. 
And if you look at his early graphics and his early ad campaigns, they were borrowing from high fashion, from Chanel and, and some of the bigger designers. And so when high fashion caught on and started picking at streetwear and urban clothing at that time, like Tommy Hilfiger and stuff, and there's always been this reciprocation, this dialogue, we kind of need each other. What I talk about sometimes is how much longer can this last or what happened to the true culture and the community of streetwear that this is where it all came from. I think it stems from a lot of fear, right? Like my fear is that streetwear has gotten to a point, this high level uh, sense of streetwear has gotten to a point where it's just about commerce and profitability, whether it's from like the big companies and them profiteering off of people or it's just the kids in line that are reselling and turning this uh, reseller economy into its own economy. Like that, because the worry there is that eventually those kids are going to figure out like, oh, they flipped a pair of Yeezys, they made 500 bucks. Once it becomes just about the money and not about the art and appreciation for the culture and appreciation for those designers and their storytelling, then that all becomes expendable. expendable. It's just about money. There's more money to be made than just in selling sneakers and streetwear. Like, News flash to all the kids that are standing in line. You don't have to stand in line. You know, you don't have to go on your apps. Like, there's much bigger, bigger dollars out there, and it's not in streetwear. And so, I think as soon as kids start realizing that and figuring that out, the entire market could potentially collapse, and that'll have an effect on everyone from top to bottom. So, last question: If you're a young kid, maybe another Korean American kid with Han. Uh, the need to express himself and get his creativity out and thinking about launching a streetwear business today. Like what's what's the advice that you can offer for doing that now in a marketplace that's radically different yeah. from the one where you started in 2003? Yeah, I think it begins with expectations. You know, I, I think um, a lot of people start businesses. It's not just streetwear, but anyone who is an entrepreneur today, they kind of have this idea of what success is and it starts with billions. You know, they're like, I wanna be like that, I wanna drive a car, I wanna, uh, again, the the wonderful thing about streetwear designers and streetwear, especially when we started, was none of us got into this to make money because there was no aspiration. There was no streetwear designer that was making billions, you know, unless you considered like Mark Echo and streetwear, but there was no one like a billionaire. And so we all did it just out of passion of like, I just wanna pay my rent. And so if you start from a place where you're already satisfied from the moment you begin your brand, you know, everyone's just like, what was the best day or what was the day you made it? I'm like, uh, it was the first day of the brand because that's the hardest thing to do is just to begin. And so as soon as people, as soon as you can just start your company, if you're satisfied with that, you're going to be good forever. It won't, it doesn't matter how much money you make and how much power and respect and glory and all that stuff. It don't shoot for that stuff. Just shoot for like, can I start my brand and start it again tomorrow and start it and just keep it going? If you can as- strive for that and hit it, you're going to be fine. Bobby, thank you for, for sharing your story. It's an amazing, amazing story. And uh, there's lots of lessons to learn. I think that last point about coming coming to the business from a source and a place of passion every day and being happy with the content you're creating, with the product you're creating, with the process of creating the product. If, if that's what's driving you, then that's, that's something that you can keep forever. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Drive, delivered by DHL, where we hear stories of entrepreneurship. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to hear more episodes and give us a rating and email us at podcast at businessoffashion.com with any questions or guest suggestions. To learn more about BOF, click on the description notes in this episode. If you've enjoyed this conversation, you might also be interested in BOF Professional, our global membership community, which keeps you up to date with everything you need to know about the global fashion industry. For a limited time only, we are offering our BOF podcast listeners an exclusive 25% discount on an annual BOF professional membership. So to get 25% off your first year of a BOF professional membership, click on the link in the episode notes, select the annual package, and enter the special discount code PODCAST2018 at checkout.